You know, also today on Sunny Side, we're going to be talking to a lovely woman who's traveled throughout the Americas, and her name is Elizabeth Waldo, and she's brought some very interesting instruments to Sunnyside today. In particular, Truman, have you ever seen an Apache violin? I can't say that I have. <laughs> you think you'd like to fiddle with that one? Who knows? Do we have it here? <laughs> yes, we do. We do. We're going to be talking about all of the ancient instruments and the music of this period, the reflective period of Southwestern Indian art in particular. Well, I look forward to it. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Just as Southwestern Indian art has a certain reflective spirituality, so does the music. And my guest right now is a very renowned composer, musician, violinist, ethnomusicologist, if you can beat that. So please welcome Elizabeth Waldo. And I understand from your background, Elizabeth, that you first heard the sounds of the Yakima Indians when you were living in the eastern part of Washington State. Yes, indeed, I did as a very young girl. And, of course, I studied, in the meantime, all of the classical area of music and in this portion of my career have gone right back to those yeah. very beginning sounds Is that it, I heard. That's interesting that you come back to the roots, to the ethnicity, right. you know, of music and all that. Because really, I mean, you started out as a, as a uh, violinist. You graduated yes. from the Curtis Institute. That's right. And one of my favorite muralists, Diego Rivera, had some wonderful inspiration for you. Yes, indeed. In fact, I think I'm kind of a throwback from Aztec uh, or pre-Hispanic times because all of the art forms were used together and I think that's one reason why I'm enjoying working on this show with Asmar too, the combination mm -hmm. of music and art and Diego Rivera was of great help to me. I would visit him in his studio and he would say, well, now if you see the Zapotec figure, what mm -hmm. do you think it might have sounded like? And mm -hmm. we would go on from there and so he was a great encouragement to me in developing this portion of my career. But we're talking about music, and we're talking about instruments that are a hundred, at least a hundred years old. How do you, do, first of all, tell us about the explorations of how you even find these rather rare instruments, and then how do you interpret the sounds, bring back the actual reality of that music and period? That's right, and it is a difficult, uh, it is what we call investigacion, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, investigador if you uh, at first you might think they're calling you a detective but mm -hmm. not at all really it means uh, musical archaeology and uh, studying these uh, ancient forms there was no written musical notation so you have to be of a very curious mm -hmm. mind well how would you create for instance at the top of the show you were playing this and I, I wasn't kidding when I said an Apache fiddle folks I mean we've got an authentic <laughs> one right here That's I mean right. this has some if Bobby can get a shot of it yes. here with this hold it up somewhat here and you can see I mean the the uh, the, the the work here the, this is obviously some all kind of symbols you symbols know like right lightning and thunder things like that right and so so sounds the music right <laughs> <laughs> now you've brought along some other instruments uh, which really look uh, fascinating may here. I just mention that sure. uh, since I was playing the stringed instrument first we could refer to all of these in the Indian terminology by calling him the woods that sing. For instance, if I were jamming with an Indian in any area of the Americas, whether it be Mexico, Peru, American Southwest, I'd say, shall I get my violin? They'd say, oh, you mean the wood that sings? So I, I love that terminology for these various Aboriginal violins that I use. Mm -hmm. Where did you actually find this instrument? Right uh, in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. It's an old one. I think you would not find them today. The uh, more modern ones are very touristy looking, mm -hmm. you see, painted, and uh, but this is a really, truly old one and from a very elderly Apache mm -hmm. man. And how do we authenticate, to... though? I mean, it's interesting that you, you were able to search and find these instruments, but how do we really know that these are of the origin, that they came from a certain period of time, that they were played in a certain way by tribesmen? I find that fascinating. Oh, yes. Well, we're, we're talking about several different media. For instance, the the ones made of ceramic or, or baked clay, for instance, would come from the archaeological tombs, you mm -hmm. see. So those are carbon dated and can be authenticated by archaeologists. And then you have to piece everything, the history, the poetry, everything that you can find about this together in order to make 
using, which is an art form. If I may just pick up this instrument here, which is one of the wind instruments, is this correct? I yes. want to use the right term. Right. And if you could get a kind of anything that, that you blow, you know, yeah. could be in the wind family. Well, let's hear now. I hope there. our audio is ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh huh. That's my own. I could use that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not uncommon to, in my scores, to have wild birds and animals going through the music, which is uh, typically an Indian way to go, although it's startling to most of our how audiences. Do they, how do they create that sound? I mean, that's unlike any other wind sound that I've heard. In oh, right. Uh, right. right. Well, just by uh, hearing and seeing in nature a bird, an eagle in this case, which goes through the mythology and the lore, and mm -hmm. then making it of ceramic uh -huh. and uh, it's been buried of course for a long long yeah. time well let's hope to bring it back now this instrument is very rare so i want to be very careful i've always had this fear you know doing talk oh, shows there's only one of those in the world so like you this. better be but this is quite magnificent if you can see that yes. i'm really nervous to hold it up that that has almost a, an aztec uh, look to it yes it is in fact you see the ceremonial for you. figures yeah. on it and i i probably won't do justice to it but i will just blow it it has a little pellet inside mm -hmm. which uh, makes the tone go up and down. Mm. You really get a feeling that there was something going on when that instrument yes, was being played. Yes, this I learned Diego Rivera how yes. to the position because mm -hmm. of his great study with the Aztec, you know, in mm -hmm. his paintings. We're talking so about uh, what year would you say this instrument was actually oh. being used? Oh, 1,500 years 1500 ago, safe. 1,500 years ago. Safe to say that amount of really time. Now, you've traveled an awful lot in the last couple of years. In fact, you just got back from China. It'd be interesting right. to, to find out yeah. how the uh, the people in China feel about these uh, oh. Native American and Hispanic ancient <laughs> instruments. That must yes. be a strange chord to their ears. Well, actually, I've added now the Asian um, idiom to my own Pan American music of Indian Hispanic background. There is a close affinity, mm -hmm. first because of the antiquity, and uh, the people in China are very eager and curious about what has happened with our ancient music. Mm -hmm. And I think my, my main goal is to bring this into perspective so that we just don't think of Indians on a reservation as mm -hmm. a relic or something you just look at but don't touch. I think it's a, a modern idiom. It should be incorporated into our musical pattern I mean, we shouldn't be listening to rock and roll all the time. I There's agree so with you. many, many beautiful oh. things that can be done. Oh, and sure. uh, so they were intrigued and uh, interested in this mm -hmm. kind of work. It'd be interesting now to hopefully, maybe, even on the show as we're talking about it, the, the music industry. I mean, Stevie Wonder in particular is great because he's always involving interesting instruments in his sessions, yeah. you know. Uh -huh. uh, and why couldn't we interpret some of these sounds? in some of the modern day music. Oh, I think we should. I think people should get used to hearing an eagle sound plow through a, a musical score mm -hmm. and think of this as, as a part of it. It, it uh, takes it away from being so far out. Now, our, our Pan American Ensemble uses it constantly mm -hmm. in um, recordings and in our concert appearances. And for those who may not attend our opening, when we're going to be doing it live, That's right. you right. You're see, involved with the Museum of uh, yes, Science and Yes, the Science and well. Industry. And if they get lost for the local gallery, they can think of the Berlin show or even the Muppets right around the <laughs> corner. But <laughs> hopefully they'll come and visit our show, too, because if they miss the live performance, they can hear this audio uh, being played mm -hmm. for two months with Asmar's gorgeous work. Oh, that's going to be a nice combination. How difficult, uh, Elizabeth, would it be for a person I mean, who doesn't have an archaeological background or an anthropological whim, but has a musical feel, especially when we're talking about primitive sounds? I mean, it kind of strikes a chord in all of us. I know as, as Alice was talking about her art, you know, I really got carried away with her spirituality and listening to you play. I think it has a direct effect, but I couldn't just... You know, I have no musical background. I couldn't just pick up one of these instruments and play. I mean, it takes years <laughs> of, of knowing Well, music. the little violins are difficult. They yeah. appear to be very easy, but you have to warm up. You have to practice them. But the jazz players usually do very well in my orchestra because they have a sense of imagination, mm -hmm. improvisation, and no holds barred, so mm -hmm. to speak. They will experiment and... Uh, Is there a lot of improvisation? I mean, I know from scenes that I've seen in... Uh, 
movies that are depictive, depictive of Native Americans, you always see instruments such as this, and, and there's, there's a beat going on, but, I mean, like, I'm trying to get into it here. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, is there any kind of musical order, or is it just basically taken from spirit, and are you moved by the sun setting, or the hope of a rain coming down, mm -hmm. or what is it that motivates well, this if kind of you, music? Well, if you do it in a, a strict Indian orchestra, it, does ha it, it may appear to be improvised, but it's really not. It has a strict form, mm -hmm. but in our ensemble, we are able to uh, be a little freer with that because uh, the worst thing is if a musician says the bar ends here and you have to <laughs> cut it off, and it shouldn't be. Yeah. It should be extended on and, and flow into a lyrical mm -hmm. feeling without uh, restrictions. So like in that, that sense, it's innovational and it's a lot like jazz. Right. It has that openness. Yes. Right. I've been noticing this down here, and I, I mean. I would venture to think that it, it's possibly um, the shell of a tortoise. Right. <laughs> it looks like it. <laughs> you can see it here. Wait, let's see. Camera around here. Here you go. So. Right here. Now, this is this some kind of a, a drum or percussion? In, indeed, it is. It's a very important drum. It has uh, two two distinct notes of our scale, and it is has been used for at least two thousand years in Indian orchestras. It's the hollowness then that makes that sound, right? Well, yes, because this is like a resonating right. chamber down here. And uh, and this is a very old instrument as well? Well, you can find these today, but the usage mm -hmm. started about 2,000 years ago. How would you, I mean, here you are traveling from South America, Central America, I mean, preserving these instruments. What do you do as far as keeping the resonance and tone as authentic as you can and when you're talking about bone which could break and wood oh, that could yes. whittle away and things like that. Oh, I have to be extremely careful if you, if I break one of my clay yeah. instruments, it's, oh. it's gone forever. It's irreplaceable, of course. Yeah. Oh, it's really something. So where are you off to next? Where's your next journey? Well, we're, going to, we're going to do the opening night with this uh, Southwest show, of course. That's coming right up. And then I'll be traveling um, a good part of the year, too. But by centennial year, you see, honoring right. La Reina de la Porcincula. Which means? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Los Angeles. Right. <laughs> and so I have a lot of work yeah. to do because I work with the Hispanic music, too, you see. Right. And uh, so a lot of presentations. Elizabeth, thank you so much oh, for it's sharing such a great your pleasure music for me. with us. Okay. We're going to just take a break, and uh, Truman and I will be right back to say goodbye. So please stay with us. Don't forget, if you want to see the wonderful art of Alice Asmore and the musical instruments and music of Elizabeth Waldo, please don't miss the exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry through March of 1981. And thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful, really. You learned how to play with the past.